Uh, our next speaker is Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides. She's a consultant to Virgin Galactic. She's also related to somebody that's pretty well in charge of that company. Uh, Loretta co-founded an event, I don't know, what year was it when the first Yuri's Night occurred? 2001. 2001. And that's gone viral. It's a worldwide party. We've done them in San Diego. They've even had them in Antarctica and on the space station as well. Um, Loretta's also a founder astronaut of Virgin Galactic uh, with her husband, George. And uh, eventually they plan to have a honeymoon in space. How long have you been married now? 11 years. 11 years, so 15, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, I hope you've been, tra I'm sure, I know you've been traveling. Uh, she's a prominent public speaker, author, and author on space exploration as co-creator of Yuri's Night. Also, she's been very involved in a program within Virgin Galactic and one that I think should go global. And I'll let Laura, uh, Loretta tell you about that right now. Thank you very much. I guess the water goes right there. No, that's not gonna, I'll put it there. Okay, good morning. It's nice to be back. I've been hanging out with Bob since I was a, a freshman in college, so this is, uh, this is good to see you guys. Um, so my passion is looking at not just how do we build the spaceships and the systems that will get us off planet, but who are we gonna be when we get there? I like to say, you know, a lot of us, I was definitely inspired by Star Wars and Star Trek. And I wanted, you know, a lot of us got inspired to go into engineering and to build the replicators and the communicators and the spaceships. And I got inspired to build the culture that we see in science fiction um, to go along with the spaceships. Because I figured if we get to Mars and we're just being the same jerks that we are here, it's really not going to seem that different. It's not going to be really as fun or as cool as you want it to be. So, um, my job is to help us um, become the people that we want to be when we're on Mars. Okay, thanks. Um, so, oh, fantastic. I've got this fantastic piece of technology here. Um, so I'm interested in, in how do we use our passion for space to drive our own personal growth and development and our society's growth and development. And that's why I call myself a Jedi trainer because it's an easy way to explain to people like what it is we're doing. We want us to create like a Jedi culture. So the first thing I did, as uh, Dave was telling you, in 2001, George and I co-created Yuri's Night, which is the World Party for Space. And so for the last 16 years, we've been using a our first effort was a party to use space to bring the world together. And so we have um, events all around the world, and it was the whole intention was to show that we have a, a Soviet anniversary, Yuri Gagarin's flight, and, uh, and a U.S. anniversary, the shuttle flight, and that we can use the power of space to show, make the world a smaller place and that, that it brings us all together. So we've been doing that around the planet. Uh, that's, that's us in 2002. Um, this is the party, this is one, one of my favorite parties we've done. Uh, this was at NASA Ames. This is probably 2009. Oh no, sorry, 2007. Good thing I put a text on my slides. Um, we basically threw a giant rave in the hangar, in the Sophia hangar at, at NASA Ames um, and we had DJ going, and we even brought the music down at 11 p.m. and had Chris McKay come out and do a talk on looking for life on Mars. And we were a little nervous about how it was going to go um, when you bring the music down at a rave and put on a science talk. But, um, <laughs> but it, it was fantastic. You, if, if any of you seen Chris McKay, he's, he's great. So they were just eating out of the palm of his hands. He was like, we're going to look for life on Mars. It's like CSI Mars. And everyone's like, yeah, CSI Mars. <laughs> it's cool. Um, so that was really fun. They had an air show there. You know, Buzz Aldrin was there. You know, uh, Steve Wozniak. It's, so it's been a lot of fun. I'm doing that here in LA. Um, I host the LA event. We do it under the space shuttle in LA, uh, which is a lot of fun to party under the space shuttle. Um, two, oh, sorry, back one. Two years ago, we had um, Buzz Aldrin with, with us partying under the space shuttle in LA. It doesn't get much better than that. Um, so that was a lot of fun. We. Um, it's definitely a unique event, you know, bringing together, uh, we bring together the artists and the musicians together with the scientists and the engineers. Um, and because, you know, 
they, we can give them access to the, you know, the excitement of what the real space story, and they can help us communicate our vision to the world in a way that's, that's compelling. And so it's a really great partnership that we, we, we build there. So we do this party, um, Yuri's Night happens every April, around April 12th, that's the, the dual anniversary. Um, in LA next year, it'll be April 7th, Saturday, we do it on the Saturday before. Um, if you want to join us, and and this year Yuri's Nights LA is also involved with a extra. We're throwing an extra party under the shuttle this year. Next Friday night is the 21st. We're throwing a party to celebrate the 21st, 25th anniversary of Dr. Mae Jameson's um, historic flight into space. She was the first woman of color to fly in space, and so we're doing a, an extra party under the shuttle next Friday. If if you want to join, um, you can get tickets at uh, 25strong.com. Um, and you can even, we even have a discount code for Yuri's Night folks, uh, YN for Yuri's Night 25 for 25, the 25th anniversary, um, if you want to join us for a, a party next Friday. And, the, and we're also doing a whole Nexus event that whole weekend in Santa Monica. Um, we're doing an opening reception on Thursday night at Rand, if anyone wants to join for that, and then um, other sessions throughout the weekend in, in Santa Monica. Um, just Google 100 Year Starship is the host and Nexus in Santa Monica. And uh, it should be fun. They'll help. We have our science fiction award banquet that night and things like that. I think we're having someone from The Expanse come out, which will be pretty cool. Ah, this, I've, I've got too heavy a hand for this. Um, you know, as we talked about, we also got involved with Virgin Galactic. Um, in 2005, George and I bought our tickets to fly with Virgin Galactic, we became customers. Um, and I was really excited about getting to work with Virgin Galactic or getting to be a part of that family because Richard Branson, who's the, the founder and chairman of, of Virgin, uh, is just such an extraordinary human being. This is him standing at the top of Necker Island. Um, and he just has a beautiful attitude towards the world and he has, gives back so much. He's working so much with, the, with trying to transform business and, and the carbon war room and, and giving back with uh, Virgin Unite and all the work that he does um, with the elders and with the oceans. Um, and so it's really a, a pleasure to get to work with, with him because when he, ta he talks about um, opening space for good, um, he really means it on all, level and, and all levels. And what I love about it is um, when he does things, he does it with love. Um, he doesn't, I work with a lot of you know, high-powered business types and um, like James Cameron on our, we did a, ocean, we did a move, I did a, worked on a the movie set with James Cameron to do the Aliens of the Deep filming. And you know he's. We would always give him a hard time on set because we're like he's got a really bad reputation in Hollywood for being really hard driving. And we're always like, James, why are you why are you yelling at everyone? And he's like, well, it, it produces results. And since he's got the highest grossing movies of all time, it was hard to argue with him. But but it w but I but we talked to James Cameron about it. Like you know, what if you could produce those results and still be you know gracious and respectful uh, and inclusive and you. And actually, I, you know, I've seen him more recently, and he's, he's, he said he's mellowed, people say he's mellowed in age, and, and he's really inspired by Shackleton. I think he even wants to do a movie about Shackleton, the, the um, Antarctic explorer, and really, because he really admired Shackleton, because he was one of those leaders who could produce results, incredible results, keeping all of his crew alive on the ice in Antarctica for two years, um, with morale, and with respect, and with lifting people up. And so that's what, what, I want, what I'm really interested in bringing to us as an industry and, uh, and using our passion and our drive for Mars to help drive us to become a better, better species, a better people and a better species. So I know George already showed you some of the eye candy, so usually when I'm giving my talks, I have to put in some fun shots of uh, what we're doing at Virgin Galactic and our beautiful spaceport in New Mexico. Um, and what I really wanted to talk with you guys about today is um, the Jedi training that we do. And so at Virgin Galactic, I'm the lead Jedi trainer, and we offer um, in the spring semester and in the fall semester eight sessions of Jedi training to anyone on the company who wants to participate. And it's really a lot of fun. Um, you know, I talk about how what I do is um, people physics. So I say that the most complicated subsystem of any space vehicle is the people who are building it and the people who are operating it. Uh, mostly because there's no equations that model our human behavior. We're, we're just a little too unpredictable and, and quirky. And so it's really a, a adds a lot of complication and actually um, has caused a lot of challenges in our industry and, and, and some fatalities as well. And so we have to be really mindful as a community about how we treat each other and, and how we listen to each other and how we work together as teams because what we're doing in space um, is life or death, and um, sometimes little disputes that would be nothing on Earth could um, 
could be catastrophic in a really the really vulnerable environments of a space station or uh, a Mars base. And so our first lesson in Jedi training is that everything you do matters. We talk about how you walk into a meeting. Every sigh, every eye roll, every sarcastic comment lands. People hear it. People pick it up. I talk to our, our fresh outs, people coming straight out of school. And I, you know, I tell them, that, you know, wherever you are in the org chart, it doesn't matter. Like, you make a difference in what you bring to the company, how you walk in every morning, how you greet people, how you say hello, how you make eye contact, how you remember people's names. All these things make a difference. You matter wherever you are. Um, I love to, so usually on this slide I like to quote my husband, so it's sort of funny to have him in the audience for this. Um, but one of my things that he likes to say that I love is that all your problems look small from low Earth orbit. <laughs> Even that hurricane kind of looks small from low Earth orbit. Um, and it, it, that's one of the really gifts of space flight is, is the perspective that it gives us. And when you can get perspective on your life and on yourself and really look at uh, things from a distance, it can help me calm down when I want to just scream at my kids um, and get some, um, some space on what you're looking at and, and be able to take, take, a, take a moment to think about how you really want to react and how you, who you, how, what you really want to be remembered for. I mean, in these, especially in these days where every, some angry tweet you fire off could, um, is, could follow you around for a long time. So just to be really um, thoughtful and careful about um, what you're saying and doing and keeping that perspective that space gives us on maybe this isn't such a, there's actually I don't know if you ever I just I'm really into the move the musical Hamilton right now and there's a great line after Burr shoots Alexander Hamilton in the famous duel in the early 1800s they, they there's a song in the musical version of Hamilton where Burr says you know maybe the world was wide enough for Hamilton and me you know, maybe, maybe I didn't have to kill him. I mean, maybe it's maybe the planet's big enough for all of us to be here together. So it's a good thing to think about. Maybe, maybe the world's wide enough for all of our different opinions. Jedi rule number one: Don't throw anyone under the sand crawler. <laughs> so we love to, uh, yeah. So making it fun and just the idea that we're all in this together. I mean, the space community. You know, we. What I love about our community is that we have a bond. We have a common love for space, and we share that. And a rising tide lifts all boats. So being respectful and inclusive of everyone and not saying, like, well, their ideas are stupid and our ideas are right, and being like, well, you know, they have a different idea, and, you know, we wish them, we're excited for them to succeed, and we're really passionate about, what, you know, our, our mission, too. So, you know, whether it's somebody, you know, on your team at work or somebody, are we trying to fix the microphone? Can you give it a tweak? Thanks, sir. Um, you know, not to throw your competitors under the bus, because in the, in the grand scheme of things, once we get to 12 different star systems, they're not going to be your competitors. They're, they're all, they're, they're all, they're all going to be, you're going to walk into a bar, and this guy's going to have a sweatshirt that says Earth on it. You're like, Earth? I'm from Earth, too. That's awesome. This is great. Uh, so, you know, getting a big enough, uh, you know, tent to include everyone. You don't have to throw anyone under the bus. Or a coworker, you know, like, well, I got my stuff on time, but these guys are ones keeping everything late. You know, it's like, well, you know, what could we do to help them? What could we do to get? Because we want every, we want the project to be on time, don't we? So, how can we help them? It's no one's fault. Let's make it work. Um. So yeah, so it's a, it's been a fun journey. It's um. Uh, you know, I'm learning and growing. I'm, I'm still not the Jedi I want to be, um, but I'm working on keeping a beginner's mind and remembering to always keep training and developing myself. And my message to all of you is to keep looking on training and developing yourselves and always looking. There's a whole bunch of things out there, just like the same way we didn't used to understand radiation. And then, you know, Mary Curie did a lot of work and sort of figured it out and like, oh, this stuff is a, this is a big deal. We got to figure this, we got to learn how to harness this. I think there's a lot of other things that humanity hasn't learned to harness yet. Um, and our own potential and, and, and power is one of them. And I think that's something that, as an industry, if we pull together and figure out, we can bring back to our whole species. Um, and that could be one of the biggest spin-offs that comes from space flight, is uh, helping humanity, as Yoda would say, give up anger, fear, and aggression. So I invite you guys to keep working on your own Jedi training. Um, I have a, I'm working on a book right now. It's called The New Right Stuff. 
um, to help people who want to like create it. Because I think that the people in the early in the Apollo days um, had the right stuff. They they had the grit. They had the courage. They had the stamina. The, and they had the endurance and the strength. And I think for the next for the next wave of space exploration, what we need to do is build on that and add in a whole another level of skill sets that we're also going to need, which is vulnerability and authenticity, and honesty, um, and community. And so that's, for me, the new right stuff. And that's the taking things to the next generation. So I encourage, if you're interested in um, checking out an advanced copy of the new right stuff, you can go to my website, lorettawhitesites.com. There's um, some pre-publication versions of it there. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Loretta Whiteside, sorry, Loretta Hidalgo. I had, I've had this more than 11 years. Um, and really my message to all of you is just to be fully who you are and come do what you came to Earth to do. Because I believe that if each of us fulfilled our own personal mission, what you're here to do, that we get it all done, get it all handled. Um, so yeah, so follow your dreams and you'll give others the permission to follow theirs too. Thank you very much. Hi, Loretta. My name is Justin McCarthy. Justin. Um, a question. A takeoff of uh, Jedi training. The Jedis were somewhat uh, noted for their use of a variety of integrative arts in their training. Is there any role for integrative arts? I mean, humanity has a real legacy of uh, yogic disciplines, Taoist disciplines, Egyptian disciplines, things of this nature. And yet, this entire endeavor seems to be extremely left brain oriented. Can you speak to that? That's really beautiful, Justin. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I'm here. That's my mission. So I'm trying to bring another conversation to the space exploration because we are a very left brained community. You know, we're scientists and engineers mostly who will get to work on the programs. And so um, I'm interested in, in bringing this, you know, this, the, the yoga and the meditation and the other wisdom traditions um, to draw from because you know we don't have to reinvent the wheel people have done this thinking before so we just need to do the work to study it to learn from it and to take what works um, with us onto the frontier so i've got a question i'm actually english we have a very small country and we have to live in very close confined areas yeah, all the time. So America has so much space. Yeah. You, I don't think you really appreciate how much space you have. <laughs> I, I honestly don't think you do. And one of the things we're going to have with any space program is we'll be living in tuna cans. Yes. Uh, and people, you know, it's like we're rats in a cage. So yeah. how do you think we need to adapt to that environment? Yeah, you can't underestimate it. I mean, I had the privilege of getting to go up to um, Hot and Crater, up um, where the Flashline Research Station is. Um, and that was one of the things that profoundly struck me. I mean, I was only there for two weeks. But, um, you know, I, we weren't in sim, so I wasn't wearing a spacesuit, and we didn't have, a, I wasn't in the habitat. You know, we were just in tents. But I was very present to that. I could feel the wind on my skin. I could touch the river. Um, I could smell the air. Um, I could, f and I'm just realizing, um, I was in being outside basically, and that if I was in sim or if I was on Mars, that I wouldn't be able to go outside ever. I mean, you can go outside in your spacesuit, but you're not outside as we think of it, like interacting directly with your senses with your environment. And so, um, you know, it's, so I think these simulations are really useful because it's, it, it's just so much different than you. You don't appreciate how, how hard it is, how different it is. It's the same when we went to the bottom of the ocean. We were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean um, on the Russian research vessel, the Keldish. The, it's the same. We were diving to the bottom of the ocean in the same submersibles that um, Cameron used to dive in Titanic, if you've seen the movie Titanic. And we were out at sea for a month. 
And it's the same thing. We we're out of range of 911 if we had an emergency. There was no helicopter that could come, that could fly out to the middle of the ocean. It's out of their range, and there's nowhere to land a plane, and it would take three days for a Navy ship to get to us. So you really have that profound experience of being on your own with no, no support, no rescue. And, and as an American, I, like you said, I, didn't, I couldn't quite grok how, diff how much that changes things. You take, you cut, you, you cut your apple a little differently when you know there's no, um, no air helicopter taking you to a, a, an emergency room. You know, you're like, you, you are more present, you think about it. And when you're about to dive at the bottom of the ocean where there's two, you know, two hours, two miles down underwater, you're like, what am I, do I really want to do this? You, the, your mortality s speaks up a little louder. So, so I think you're absolutely right. We don't appreciate it and it, it's going to be a big challenge. And so I think we need to be thinking about these things and training for it and, and helping people, ex especially Americans, go out, outside of our comfort zone so we know what it, to experience. I think wintering over, I haven't wintered over in Antarctica, but I think if you could do that, you could probably do anything. Uh, yeah, simple question. You mentioned the elders when you were uh, men listing uh, groups. Could you expand on what the elders are? Yeah, so Richard Branson started a group called the Elders, which is basically a circle of elders for the planet, which is a great idea. So it's like Nelson Mandela uh, before he died, and you know Desmond Tutu and Jimmy Carter, um, Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland after the um, war. Um, and so just people who, you know, no longer have a, you know, a retire, they don't, well, no longer represent a, a nation state, but have a, you know, a, a commitment to the stewarding of the planet. And so they gather together and they, you know, will go to war zones or, or help try to mediate, you know, different conflicts um, and, and, and speak up on behalf of, you know, people who have no voice. It's a really beautiful, it's a really beautiful effort. I wonder if anybody's looked at using maybe some wind in the suit or smells or sounds, bird sound. Mm -hmm. Would that help psychologically if you're going to be there for months? I know. I think about this sometimes. Like sometimes I'll see like an ant or maybe something not as cute, not as tolerant that you tolerate in your house as an ant. Well, let's stick with ants. Um, and sometimes I think, wow, if he was a stowaway, if I was on Mars and an ant had stowed away and he was calling on my desk on Mars, he would be like the most precious object. I wouldn't kill him on Mars. He's like the only ant on Mars. He's like mascot. He's like your pet now. And you're like, hey, I got an ant. And he's a life form and he's independent and he moves and he's beautiful. And so, yeah, I think you would appreciate um, these things a lot. When we were in the Arctic, we had um, two huskies that we rented from the Inuits uh, village to as um, uh, guard dogs for the polar bears. They, they're supposed to guard the camp and give you early warning if polar bears are coming. They had a job. But they were also really, it was also really nice to have dogs in camp. You know, we were, we were a bunch of scientists and, and engineers and professionals working in this camp. Um, and so, you, you know, you didn't have any, a lot of human contact. Um, you know, everyone's far from home, but, you know, people go and cuddle the dogs or pet the dogs. And, and so... Um, Anyway, so yeah, putting wind in your suit or senses in your suit, um, all these things are going to be important. I think the art that Vera showed you um, is also going to be super important. We under, a lot of us underestimate in our left brainness, you know, the importance of art and music. And I, I, I remember there was this funny moment when my son was younger. He sort of started expressing a little bit of interest in music. And I had that typical left brain reaction of like, oh, he's not going to major in music. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm a scientist. And... Um, and then I had the thought, like the thing that most impacted me, the thing that's most, one of the most sacred things to me in the world is Star Wars. And I had the thought, what if John Williams, the, the composer of the soundtrack of Star Wars, which is, it wouldn't be Star Wars without the soundtrack, right? What if John Williams' mother had said, oh, I don't want him to major in music. <laughs> and I realized, like, it takes everyone we, there's a role for all these things. That's important. It lifts up. It lifts up our spirit. It's important to, to we have to tend to our, our mind, our body, and our spirit, and our, all of our society. And we need to take all of that with us to Mars. And we need to be willing to include it, see the value of it, 
and make it part of us. So thank you very much.